Good morning everyone and a warm welcome to you this morning as we gather together to worship God with one another. Just a, a few things for me to mention as we get underway uh, this morning. Uh, first of all, uh, just to say that we'll be in John's Gospel once again. We're going to be in chapter 7 uh, this morning, looking at the last few verses of uh, that chapter uh, as we conclude uh, the section about Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. Then our, our service this evening will be at 6 o'clock. We'll be in Romans once again, continuing uh, with the next little section uh, in Romans chapter 5. Uh, there'll not be refreshments uh, tonight as there normally would be uh, on the last Sunday of the month, but, but not this evening. And then in the week ahead, there's a, a few uh, things to mention uh, as well. The women's Bible study is taking place here at 8 o'clock on Tuesday evening. Then on Wednesday, um, there's the prayer gathering at half past 7. On Thursday, mums and toddlers at half past 10 and relate at 7 p.m. And then next Sunday, uh, quarter past 10 for the Sunday school. Uh, half past 11 for the morning service. We're delighted to have Keith Edgar coming along to take that morning service. Uh, and then in the evening, it will be uh, me again in Romans. And uh, we'll also be celebrating the Lord's Supper at the end of that service next Sunday evening as well. Then just a, a couple of other things uh, to mention. Uh, I put this out on the WhatsApp, but uh, this time next week it will be December. So we're, we're not too far from Christmas. Uh, we've got a, a stack of these Christmas devotionals which are available for free. Uh, and so if you'd like uh, one of those to take you through the month of December in the run up to Christmas, please do help yourself to one of those. Uh, they're on the desk just as you head out there. And then also uh, next Saturday, um, there is a, a conference that EMF are running. It's called From Ember to Flame, Revitalizing Declining and Dying Churches. And that is taking place at Spramillis EPC. There are leaflets um, of these around somewhere, so you can find them uh, and have a look at them. That's next Saturday over at Spramillis. Well, let me read some verses now from Isaiah chapter 55. Uh, again, we've been looking at uh, John chapter 7 recently, Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. And as we were thinking about last Sunday morning, uh, there's that theme of water uh, in the, the Feast of Tabernacles, the imagery of the water in the wilderness, uh, fulfilled by Jesus who gives the living water, uh, welling up to eternal life. Let's think about that imagery now from uh, the Old Testament in Isaiah chapter 55 as our call to worship this morning. Isaiah writes, Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and he who has no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend your money for that which is not bread? And your labour for that which does not satisfy. Listen diligently to me and eat what is good and delight yourselves in rich food. Incline your ear and come to me hear that your soul may live. So we come to God this morning through his son Jesus and by the power of his spirit to hear his word that our souls may live. And as we come to worship God, we're going to sing our, our first item of praise this morning. It's Psalm 110. And as you may know, this is just a, a wonderful psalm, one of the, uh, the most important of all the psalms, because it's a, a psalm which speaks so directly about Christ and, and who he is. It's the psalm, actually, that is referred to in the New Testament more than any other psalm. Uh, because it so clearly points us to Jesus, uh, who he is and, and what he has come to do. The Lord said to my Lord, sit here at my right hand until I make your foes a stool on which your feet may stand. Psalm 110, we'll stand and sing together. <laughs> Thank you. 
extend from Zion's hill. With royal power you rule among those who oppose your way. When you display your power, your people flock to you. At dawn arrayed in holiness, your youth will come like you. Unchangeably the Lord, with solemn purpose sworn, just like Melchizedek, you at your right hand, there he will ever stay, he on his day of wrath will crush the kings who bar his way. The nations he will judge, the Please be seated. We come to God now in prayer. Let's pray together. A great God, our loving Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the great blessing and privilege that it is this morning to be able to gather together as your people and to come and worship you and as we do so, we praise and thank you for these amazing words of Psalm 110 that we have just sung, this psalm which points us to Jesus, the one who is your son, the one who is our king, the one who is seated at your right hand, our king forevermore, reigning over all things in fulfilment of all of your promises. And not only is he our great king, great David's greatest son, but also, as this psalm goes on to say, he is our great high priest, a priest forever. We thank you that he is the one who has offered the one sacrifice that was needed to deal with all of our sin. We thank you for his sacrifice on the cross, where he gave his life as a ransom for many suffering the punishment that we deserve. Father, we confess before you that we are sinful people, deserving only of your wrath. And yet we look to Jesus, we trust in him and all that he has done for us. We rest in his finished work because he has lived the life that we have failed to live. And he has died the death that we deserve to die, suffering your condemnation in our place. And he has risen again from the dead and has ascended to heaven and is now seated at your right hand. We thank you that there he is interceding for us. And from there one day he will return to gather all of his people together. And so it's through him that we draw near to you this morning to worship you. Acknowledging and confessing our sin before you. And praying that through Christ and because of him you would forgive us and cleanse us for all of our sin. And not only is Jesus our great king and our great high priest, but also he is the great prophet, the one to whom we must listen, 
even as Moses spoke to the people of Israel in the wilderness, that one day you would raise up for them a prophet to whom they must listen. We thank you that Jesus is that great prophet. And we thank you that this morning we can listen to his word. And so we pray that as we do so, you would give to each one of us here this morning a humble and receptive heart that is ready to receive your word. We pray that your spirit would apply that word to each of our hearts and lives. That we would grow in the grace and knowledge of Christ. That through him we would be comforted in all of our suffering. That our fears would be stilled. That our confidence in Christ would grow. That our godliness would increase. That our wisdom would advance. That in all things we might give glory to you. And we pray as well, Father, that that many others would turn to Christ and and trust in him. Again, we've sung this wonderful psalm which speaks of, of your people flocking to Christ. Father, we pray that we would see that happening. That we would see men and women and boys and girls in this area coming to Jesus, trusting in him. Receiving in him the living water that Jesus speaks of in John chapter 7. So, Father, we pray you'd bless our ministry here, that we would see much fruitfulness in the days ahead. We pray not only for our our work here, but we do remember Ethan today especially. Father, we look back on Wednesday evening, the ordination service that took place here. We thank you for the encouragement that time was, as many gathered together, and as Ethan was ordained to the ministry and installed as minister of Cross Collier Street. And Father, as he begins his ministry in earnest today, we ask that as he leads his first service as minister there, even right now, that he would know your blessing, your encouragement. And as we thought about on Wednesday evening, Father, we pray that you would bring restoration and blessing and new life to the people in that part of Belfast. Father, as well, we pray for the work of the gospel in other parts of the world and Today we're mindful of the the Craig family over in India for the engagement celebrations. We thank you for their safe arrival. And we look back to last month when it was great to have Sam with us here and taking our services. And we pray for him and his ministry there, that you would provide for them all that is needed. We know that they face much opposition and persecution. We pray that you would protect your people. And that even in the midst of that difficult context in India, that there be wonderful fruitfulness as your word is preached. Be with them today as, as they gather to worship. And may, they, may their hearts be filled with joy as they come to worship your son. And would you build up your people there for your glory's sake. So Father, we thank you for all these things. And all of this we pray in the strong name of your son and our saviour. Jesus Christ. Amen. Continuing with a few more words from Isaiah 55, we read, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord that he may have compassion on him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. So let's sing together once again. We'll turn now to uh, hymn number 107. And in considering uh, Psalm 110, we, we've thought about how Jesus is our King and our Priest and how he's also our great prophet. And let's sing of those great truths concerning Christ now as we. We turn to this hymn, Jesus, eternal God, became the Son of Man. We'll stand and sing together. He came to make God. 
Bible there, please turn with me to John chapter 7, and we'll begin reading a a section now from uh, verse 37, John 7 verse 37 and, and following. So let's hear God's word to us. On the last day of the feast, the great day, Jesus stood up and cried out, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Now this he said about the spirit whom those who believed in him were to receive. For as yet the spirit had not been given because Jesus was not yet glorified. When they heard these words, some of the people said, this really is the prophet. Others said, this is the Christ. But some said, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David? And comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was. So there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. The officers then came to the chief priests and Pharisees 
who said to them, Why did you not bring him? The officers answered, No one ever spoke like this man. The Pharisees answered them, Have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is accursed. Nicodemus, who had gone to him before, and who was one of them, said to them, Does our law judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? They replied, Are you from Galilee too? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. Well, we thank God for his word and pray for his blessing as we listen to his word, both read and preached today. I'm going to invite the boys and girls, please, to uh, come and join me at the front here as we speak to them for a, a few minutes this morning. It's good to see you this morning. I've got a quiz for you, okay? I'm going to show you some photographs of people. And you have to tell me who these people are, okay? Uh, but the trick is that there's only a little bit of that person's face in the photograph. So you can't see the whole picture. There's only a little bit of them. But I hope you might recognize who at least some of these people are. So, yeah. You know what this is God the Son and existed forever and ever because 
to follow God. But secondly, they need to follow humans. That 2,000 years ago, the first Christmas Eve, he came to earth to be king of human beings. So he's now fully God and he's fully human. And that he's the king, the promised king that God said he would send his people. And he's the great priest who offered a sacrifice for our sins. And he's the great prophet, the one that we must listen to who wants to know God's word and God's word for our lives. And when we see the full picture, we understand who Jesus is and we can come to him and trust in him. And so do think about that this morning as we're listening to the story from John chapter 7. How important it is not just to know a little bit about Jesus, but to see the full picture of who he is, recognise that he's God's Son and our Saviour. And therefore, seeing the full picture, recognise him and come to him and trust in him as your Saviour. So thank you so much for your answers uh, this morning. I'm going to say a short prayer for you now. Uh, let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you've given us your Son, Jesus, to be our Saviour. And yet as we think about uh, these things in John chapter 7 this morning, we see that so many people don't see the full picture of who Jesus is. They don't recognise who he really is. And so we pray for these little ones at the front and we pray for the, the whole congregation that you would open our eyes this morning, Jesus, that we see the full picture of who Jesus is, that we recognise who he is and come to him and trust in him so that we can be friends with you both now and forever. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Now head off back to your uh, seat, please, and we're going to sing out our next hymn, which is number 435. We'll stand and sing together. <laughs> seat. Uh, let's pray together now as we come to God's word. Father we thank you so much for your words to us and we thank you for this passage in John chapter 7 and we pray that this morning as we listen to your word that indeed as we've just sung that your mighty voice would be heard. Lord use me and speak to all of us we pray. And show us, Jesus, that we might recognise fully who he is and trust in him for eternal life. Because we pray these things in his precious name. Amen. Well, please do have your Bible open there at that closing section of John chapter 7. And we're going to be looking at verses 40 through to 52 this morning. 
And last Sunday morning, we spent our time looking at those wonderful words of Jesus in verses 37 and 38. And we saw that Jesus is the one who fulfills that symbolic imagery of water. Uh, that he alone is the one who can satisfy the thirst of our hearts. And so he calls people to come to him and drink by believing in him. And he promises to give his spirit to his people so that whoever believes in him, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Jesus says, if anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. Now you'll be familiar with the saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make it drink. And I know very little about horses, but in some way, people are just the same, aren't they? You can even lead someone to the living water that Jesus offers, but you cannot make them drink. You cannot make a person come to faith in Jesus. And indeed, there are many people who hearing the gospel of Jesus freely offered to them, still refuse to come to him and drink. And the question is, why? What stops people from coming to Jesus in faith? And that's what this passage at the end of chapter 7 is all about. Throughout this, this great chapter, John has told us about the ministry of Jesus at the Feast of Tabernacles. And now in this concluding section of the chapter, he shows us two groups of people, both of whom, on the whole, refuse to respond to Christ's offer of living water. The first group is the crowd. Their response to Jesus is seen in verses 40 to 44. And then the second group is the religious leaders. And their response to Jesus is seen in verses 45 to 52. And with each group, there is a reason why they fail to come to Jesus and drink. They're led to the water, but they will not drink. And so let's look at these things. Why do people fail to come to Jesus? And here's the first reason, because of incomplete understanding concerning Jesus. Incomplete understanding concerning Jesus. Many years ago, my brother had a, a summer job working in an old people's home. And I remember him telling me the story of how one afternoon he was sitting around a, a table with four elderly ladies together doing a jigsaw puzzle. And they got to the end of it and there was four pieces missing. And they were looking for a while at this incomplete picture of the jigsaw. And it turned out that each of the four ladies around the table that had a, a piece hidden in their hand because they wanted to be the one to put the final piece in the jigsaw. I want you to think of, of that image of an incomplete jigsaw. Uh, some of the pieces are there, and they're in the right place, and yet some of the pieces are, are missing, or at least they haven't been put in the right place yet. And so you cannot see the, the full picture. Uh, you can see things only partially, but not fully. <coughs> And that's what it's like for the crowd you see in, in verses 40 to 44. And John tells us about actually three different groups within the crowd. And it's as if each of these three groups has got some of the pieces of the jigsaw in the right place. But none of them can see the full picture. So the first group is, is actually quite positive about Jesus. 
having heard Jesus preaching, this is what they say. This really is the prophet. This really is the prophet. Now what do they mean by that? Remember that just a, a few moments beforehand, that Jesus has said that he is the one who fulfills that biblical imagery of the water in the wilderness. Remember the story of the people of Israel in the wilderness. They were thirsty. They, they had no water. And then Moses struck the rock and, and water came out. And the people were able to drink and their thirst was satisfied and their lives were saved. And so the crowd is thinking about that story of the, the wilderness. And Moses leading the people of Israel through the wilderness. And how Jesus says, he, actually, he is the one who is the true fulfillment of all of that imagery. And that sparks something in their mind. It, it makes them think of Deuteronomy chapter 18. Because in that chapter, Moses said that after him, God would raise up a, a great prophet, a, a bit like him, but better than him. So listen to these words of, of Moses from Deuteronomy 18. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your brothers. It is to him you shall listen. The Lord said to me, I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their brothers. And I will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak to them all that I command him. And so this section of the crowd jumps to the conclusion that perhaps Jesus is the prophet that Moses had spoken of. And then there's others in the crowd and, and they say something different. This second group also has a, a positive view about Jesus, but they understand him differently. They, they see something different as they look at Jesus. They say, this is the Christ. This is the Christ. And it's not that they have one particular passage of Scripture in mind, but they knew from the Old Testament prophets that one day God would send his anointed one, literally the word is in the Hebrew Messiah, or in the Greek, the Christ, the anointed one, the one who would come to rule and save God's people. Now Jesus has just said that he is the one who can give the living water to his people. And the living water is, of course, a, a picture of the Holy Spirit. Maybe the, the people in the crowd make a, a connection from the Old Testament because often in the Old Testament, the giving of the Spirit is described as being like the pouring out of water. And so maybe they conclude, well, if Jesus is claiming to be the one who can give the Spirit, well, surely that means that he is the one who is himself anointed by the Spirit. He is the anointed one. He's the Christ, the Messiah. And maybe Isaiah 42 came into their minds where the Lord says, Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He is the anointed one. And this section of the crowd latches on to that and says this is the Christ. And then there's a third group amongst the crowd. And unlike the first two groups, this group has a, a negative view of Jesus. They're convinced that Jesus is certainly not the Christ. And they explain why. They, they say, is the Christ to come from Galilee? Has not the scripture said that the Christ comes from the offspring of David and comes from Bethlehem, the village where David was? So notice the irony here. This group of people are familiar with Micah chapter 5 verse 2. It's one of those passages that we often read at, at Christmas time, isn't it? It's this great prophecy that when the Messiah comes, he's going to be born into David's line and he's going to be born in the little town of Bethlehem. And these people have understood that. They've got that part of the jigsaw in the right place. 
And yet they don't see the, the full picture of how that prophecy connects with Jesus. Because they think, well, isn't Jesus from Galilee? And of course he was from Galilee in the sense that that's where he'd grown up. But they don't see the full picture. They don't realise that actually his birthplace was Bethlehem, just as Micah had prophesied. And so they don't see that this prophecy is fulfilled in the person of Jesus. And so John says there was a division among the people over him. Some of them wanted to arrest him, but no one laid hands on him. And you see what's happening in the crowd, don't you? It's as if all of them have got some of the pieces of the jigsaw in the right place. But none of them can see the full picture. That this Jesus is the great prophet promised by Moses. And he is the Christ promised in the line of David. And he was born in Bethlehem as promised by Micah. But the people in the crowd fail to come to Jesus in true saving faith because of their incomplete understanding concerning him. Now it may have been the case that in time the pieces all came together for some of these people in the crowd that day and their eyes were open to see the full picture and so then they came to Jesus in faith. But the picture that John presents us with here is that these people so far have failed to come to Jesus because of their incomplete understanding concerning him. Now how might we apply all of that today? We can apply it like this. That there are a lot of people who are a lot like the people in the crowd that day. It's very clear, isn't it, that these people in the crowd were familiar with the scriptures, at least parts of the, the scriptures. Of course, they'd grown up as Jews. They were taught the scriptures from an early age. And yet for all of those privileges, their eyes are not yet open to the full picture of who Jesus really is. They've not come to Jesus in faith because of their incomplete understanding concerning him. And there are many people like that today, aren't there? Maybe they've grown up in the church. They've been taught the scriptures from an early age. They're familiar with some of the things that the Bible says about Jesus. And in fact, they've got some of the pieces in the right place. In some cases, they might actually be very positive about Jesus, like many of the people in the crowd were positive about him. And you think to yourself, why do they not just come to Jesus in faith? Having been led to the living water, why will they not drink? And the reason is they have not yet had their eyes open to see the full picture of, of who Jesus is. That he is the one who fulfills every promise of God. And that the whole picture of God's salvation is complete in him. There's many people like that, aren't there? They fail to come to Jesus in faith because of an incomplete understanding concerning Jesus. Well, that's one of these two groups. And then the, there's the other group. And the other group is the religious leaders, the, the Sanhedrin, the, the Jewish ruling council. And they too fail to come to Jesus in faith. But in their case, it, it's for a different reason. And in their case, the reason is this. Intellectual pride concerning Jesus. Intellectual pride concerning Jesus. So go back to, to verse 2, we, uh, sorry, verse 32. We read that the Pharisees heard the crowd muttering these things about Jesus and the chief priests and Pharisees sent officers <laughs> to arrest him. Uh, the chief priests and Pharisees are, are not happy that Jesus was becoming the main topic of conversation in Jerusalem. And that people were now starting to, to speculate about whether or not this man might actually be the Christ. And so they, they sent this group of officers to go and have Jesus arrested. 
And now in verse 45, that group of officers returns to the chief priests and the Pharisees, but they return without Jesus. And so the religious leaders say to them, why did you not bring him? And the officers replied, no one ever spoke like this man. They've had the opportunity to go and listen to what Jesus has to say. And it left this deep impression on them. They were struck by the authority and the truthfulness and the beauty of Jesus' teaching. They'd never heard anything like it before. And they just didn't feel able to put a stop to it by arresting him. Even though that was going to land them in trouble with the Sanhedrin, they let Jesus go free. And of course, that doesn't go down at all well with the religious leaders. Look at how they responded to these officers. They say to them, have you also been deceived? Have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? But this crowd that does not know the law is a curse. And we can sum up their attitude towards Jesus as being one of intellectual pride. Notice that. Firstly, they say, have any of the authorities or the Pharisees believed in him? And the implication is no one of any importance, no one of any social standing, no one with any level of higher education would really believe in Jesus. Now, of course, that wasn't true, because in just a few moments, one of their own, a man called Nicodemus, is going to speak. And we know that he became a true follower of Jesus. But that's what is claimed here, that, that no one who's got any real intellect would take the claims of Jesus seriously and therefore trust in him as their saviour. And you, you see, it's intellectual pride concerning Jesus and then they go a step further in what they say next they continue but but this crowd that does not know the law is a curse and again the implication is this crowd of uneducated common people they just don't really know the law they're ignorant and so of course those simple country folk who have traveled down from Galilee with Jesus. Of course, people like them might be taken in and, and follow Jesus. They just don't know any better. But not people like us, not the educated class, not the social elites, not the movers and shakers in the world. People like us don't believe in Jesus. And if you've got any sense, you wouldn't believe in Jesus either. And you see what's going on in their hearts, don't you? The reason why they will not come to Jesus in faith, very simply, is intellectual pride. And again, we're familiar with that in the world we live in today, aren't we? Over the course of the, the last two generations, uh, this wave of aggressive secularism has swept across Europe. And so much of that secularism is characterized by exactly this kind of intellectual pride concerning Jesus and his claims. You've come across it, I'm sure, online, in the media, in the workplace, in the education system. Even if it's not always said out loud, listen to how the Christian faith is spoken of. And the implication is very clear. Of course, no one who is a modern highly educated, enlightened person would really believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that he died and rose again. The world's moved on. We know better now. We live in the age of science, the, the age of reason, the age of progress. And maybe those simple folk without much of an education, maybe they need some kind of faith in Jesus as a, a crutch to help them through life. They just don't know any better. But not the elite class, not the intellectuals, not the people who really know what they're talking about. People like us don't believe in Jesus. 
And of course, it's not true. There are many highly educated people who believe in Jesus. But that's the way the world spins it. And you see, it's exactly the same mindset as the, the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees here in chapter 7, isn't it? Dressed up in 21st century secular clothing. It is refusing to come to Jesus because of intellectual pride concerning him. And thankfully, that's not where the passage ends. We've seen these two groups and these two different reasons for not coming to Jesus in faith. On the one hand, their incomplete understanding concerning Jesus, and on the other hand, their intellectual pride concerning Jesus. But finally, we notice this. Jesus saves us from both. Jesus saves us from both. And that's what we see in the life of Nicodemus. The members of the, the Sanhedrin, particularly the, the chief priests and the Pharisees, are, are spouting out this intellectual pride by which they're rejecting Jesus. And then one of their own number, Nicodemus, pipes up. And he urges them to pause and to think again about how they're responding to Jesus. And he says to them, does our Lord judge a man without first giving him a hearing and learning what he does? He's urging them to give Jesus a, a fair hearing, a, a legal hearing, before they decide to reject him and condemn him. And now that intellectual pride is turned against Nicodemus. They, they say, are you from Galilee too? In other words, are you also one of those simple, uneducated folks from Galilee who don't know any better? Search and see that no prophet arises from Galilee. But we know the full story of Nicodemus. Uh, we don't know if he was yet truly converted at this point. But we know that at some point he was. We know that Jesus saved Nicodemus. And what did Jesus save Nicodemus from? Well, amongst other things, Jesus saved Nicodemus from his incomplete understanding about Jesus. You know the story, don't you, from chapter 3. Uh, Nicodemus had come to visit Jesus. And as we listen into that conversation between the two of them in chapter 3, it becomes clear that what is stopping Nicodemus from yet coming to Jesus in true faith is that he has incomplete understanding concerning Jesus. Now, some of the pieces of the jigsaw have fallen into place already for him. After all, he, he's the teacher of Israel. He knows his Bible inside out. And so he's able to say to Jesus, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. You see, he's, he's able to see some of the picture. But he, he doesn't yet see the full picture. His understanding is incomplete. And so when Jesus then starts talking to Nicodemus about the new birth, Nicodemus doesn't have the foggiest idea what Jesus is talking about. How can a man be born when he's old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? How can these things be? He doesn't yet see the full picture of who Jesus is and what Jesus gives to his people and how everything spoken of in the scriptures is fulfilled ultimately in him. And so Jesus says to him, are you the teacher of Israel? And yet you do not understand these things. And the Nicodemus of chapter 3 would, have, would not have been out of place in the crowd in chapter 7, would he? Because he's hampered by this incomplete understanding about Jesus. And yet Jesus saved him from that. And Jesus also saved Nicodemus from his intellectual pride concerning Jesus. As John points out, Nicodemus was one of the Sanhedrin. He was one of them, as John puts it. He, he belonged to that group which, on the whole, was characterized by intellectual pride. And what is more, in, in chapter 3, he, he is described as the teacher 
of Israel. He is perhaps the leading authority on Old Testament studies in all of Israel in those days. If anyone has reason to be proud of his intellect, it was Nicodemus. And in chapter 3, we're told he went to see Jesus at night. Now, why was that? We're not explicitly told, but many would argue there is some intellectual pride going on there in Nicodemus' heart. He's a proud intellectual. He's embarrassed to admit that he might not actually have all the answers and that he needs Jesus to explain the truth to him. He's beginning to realise perhaps there's more to Jesus than he had previously assumed. And Jesus saved Nicodemus from both of these things. Jesus saved him from his incomplete understanding and from his intellectual pride. And Jesus brought Nicodemus to true faith in him. And that's why at this point here in chapter 7, Nicodemus sounds this note of caution. He, he says to his fellow members of the Sanhedrin, wait a minute, don't, don't be so quick to disregard Jesus as if there's nothing you could learn from him. Give him a, a fair hearing. Now, was Nicodemus truly converted at that point? I don't know. Maybe he was. But without doubt, he was truly converted by the time we get to chapter 19. Because it was this man, Nicodemus, who, along with Joseph of Arimathea, took the body of Jesus from the cross and laid him in the tomb, demonstrating his belief in Jesus, even whilst his Saviour was hanging on the cross. And this story of Nicodemus and his coming to faith should be a great encouragement to us when we see those around us refusing to come to Jesus in faith. And in some cases it's because of their incomplete understanding about him. And in other cases it's because of their intellectual pride concerning him. And Nicodemus shows us Jesus saves people like that. He opens their eyes to see from the scriptures the full picture of who he really is. He humbles their intellectual pride before him. He grants them true repentance and faith. He makes them his own. And he can do the same for you if you've not yet come to him. I wonder what is stopping you from coming to Jesus? Is it your incomplete understanding of who Jesus really is? Is it perhaps some intellectual pride? You think that all of this talk about coming to Jesus in faith, it all sounds a bit simplistic. Only simple, simple people would be taken in by it. Now, Jesus saves us from both of those things. And so whoever you are and whatever it is that is stopping you, Come to Jesus now and drink and you'll never be thirsty again. Let's close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank you for these words of John's Gospel and how they display to us the nature of the unbelieving heart. And Father, we confess that by nature our hearts and minds are darkened. We're futile in our thinking. And we fail to see the full picture of who Jesus is, even though in our heads we may know the scriptures well. And by nature we're so proud. We're proud of our intellect. We think that we've got things figured out ourselves. And yet, Father, we thank you that Jesus saves people like that, people like Nicodemus. And so work your salvation in all of our hearts, we pray. Save us from an incomplete understanding of Jesus. Save us from intellectual pride before Jesus. And grant us true knowledge of him, that we might come to him by faith and be saved. All of these things we pray in our Saviour's strong and precious name. Amen.
We're going to sing our final hymn, which speaks of God's grace in saving those who previously could not see the full picture of who Jesus is, people who were blind in, in their sin. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Let's stand and sing together. bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.